Recording in progress. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. Uh, it's nice to see so many returning folks and looks like folks who are here for their first Brain Club. So that's that's awesome. So um, for those I don't know yet, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns and I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong. Let me share screen and I'll get us oriented to Brain Club. So um, Brain Club is our weekly community conversation, our community education series about everyday brain life. Every week we have a different topic and uh, all oriented around a monthly theme. Um, this was, uh, you know, an education space created for the collective ABB community to educate the community about neurodiversity. Because of the kind of the limitations in our capacity here, um, where it's a, you know, a, 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 a mix of people who receive their medical care here and people who do not, um, we kind of create this, we carve this out as an education space where it's not for medical and mental health advice. And it's not a support group because we don't have for, for we don't we don't have that kind of relationship with everyone who attends. So it ends up not being safe to be, you know, processing individual trauma when 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 a person doesn't have follow-up, et cetera, if, if, if they're not our patient. Um, so that's 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 uh, what Brain Club is and is not and why. All forms of communication are okay here. All forms of participation are okay. Observation is a completely valid form of participation, um, but uh, it, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly don't expect you to look at the camera or sit still or anything. So, you know, feel, please, please feel free to do what needs doing, fidget, stim, eat, take breaks. Um, and you know everyone. Everyone's welcome here at Brain Club. Um, and uh, uh, when when there are some particularly loaded topics, like there will be tonight um, for the first part of, of of Brain Club, we'll give some content warnings on the topics in case there are some little ears around. Um, as I said, all forms of communication are okay. Um, you know, if it, we we uh, we have a a chat box going, you're welcome to use it at all times. Part of Brain Club tonight will be a pre-recorded um, uh, panel interview set. Um, we'll have the chat box going through there, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion where you're welcome to communicate with mouth words or in the chat. Um, and in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, we really want to respect and protect the, you know, the group's collective access needs, uh, particularly as the size of Brain Club has grown. So our uh, communications uh, um, advisory uh, council put together some uh, communication ground rules that we use to respect and protect group access needs. As I said, um, you know, there may be some little ears who may be listening off screen, particularly because there are a lot of folks who participate with their video off. We just ask you to be mindful of your language and respect and give space for all participants um, to, to have space to share. Okay, last bit of access um, related uh, uh, ground rules is just um, to orient you to closed captioning. So depending on your version of Zoom, to toggle on closed captions, you can choose either the live transcript closed captionings icon, or if you don't see that one, try the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You could also choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And finally, um, the chat window. So um, while we have our um, uh, particular, I mean, at all times, but particularly while we have our, 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 our video playing, um, we'll have the chat running, we'll have a facilitated chat conversation. And that is the little speech bubble icon. That's how you open the chat. All right. So it is June and we're kicking off our new theme of the month. This month is all about neurodivergent health. Um, and we've got, um, we've, we've got a, a number of, um, of, of important, exciting topics this month. And tonight we'll be talking about neurodivergent health challenges. So um, I want to just give you some background information about neurodivergent health challenges um, before we launch into um, our pre-recorded panel. So I do need to give you a content warning for the next, I'd say, five minutes. Um, I'm going to be talking about some terrifying health data, distress, 
premature death, including suicide, um, and trauma and systemic ableism, because unfortunately, these are, they're part of the status quo of neurodivergent health. So I'm gonna share some, um, some information about autistic health in particular. Nearly 80% of autistic adults have difficulty accessing primary care. And not surprisingly, um, if you, and this is again, this, this, and this research comes from people who have primary care physician relationships established, like they have a practice they belong to, and 80% have difficulty accessing care from that practice. Um, and so, not surprisingly, um, uh, 63 to 69% of untreated health conditions. Um, and despite 76% of autistic adults saying that having a good relationship with a PCP is important to them, only about a third do have a good relationship. And uh, more than a third um, don't even tell their primary care physicians that they're autistic, specifically because of fear of judgment. And so not surprisingly, lower rates of access to preventive care. And the barriers to access and care cluster around three buckets. Darty et al. in 2020 um, surveyed autistic adults and the barriers to accessing health care related to the environment, um, including like interactions with the environment, um, you know, involving sensory processing, communication, the system. Um, there are so many defaults in the healthcare system. You must pick up the phone to make an appointment. Um, you must fill out the 20 page packet to become a new patient. There are so many defaults that are a mismatch for not just autistic patients' needs, but lots of patients' needs. And the healthcare culture that um, uh, in, in which healthcare providers, I can say this because I am one, um, where we are trained that there is one correct way to be a person. And that hidden curriculum for medical trainees along the way, this is what it looks like to be in pain. Um, this is what it looks like um, uh, when, you know, anyway, there's all kinds of defaults. And um, autistic adults perceive that their healthcare providers have insufficient knowledge and skills to take care of them and harbor unhelpful attitudes. And you know, these, these uh, buckets, they apply to so many things, not just healthcare. And that's not why we're talking about this. We're talking about this because autistic patients are dying. The average life expectancy for an autistic person is 36 to 54 years not dying from autism, dying from premature cardiovascular disease and suicide. Um, I'll come to the cardiovascular disease part, which is not the, what, what we're gonna share about autistic physiology, um, also applies to the physiology known of um, ADHDers as well, we'll get to that. Um, but what I'll say about suicide is that autistic adults have a four to nine times increased risk of suicide and that that risk is higher in those with lower support needs, that is, those who are pressured to mask, um, to hide their autistic traits, that is associated with an increased risk of suicide. And so it is my medical opinion that any interventions that are driving masking behavior are increasing the risk of suicide. And not only um, when, 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 when we think about the training that primary care clinicians typically receive in autism, um, it's stereotypes, it's stereotypes. And so um, this study, Zerbo et al. in 2015, showed that less than 10% of PCPs would suspect that their patient is autistic if they volunteer information, show interest in people, discuss his emotions, and can see the whole picture. Gross! And which is why it's not surprising that so many people make it to adulthood without understanding the way that their nervous system works. And it's not just that. Um, 
it's that there are medical conditions um, that autistic and ADHD folks commonly have that um, are not part of most primary care clinicians' trainings. Joint hypermobility and related conditions, um, uh, structural issues related to the way that the skull is shaped and the jaw, the face, um, the teeth, the nervous system, autonomic or automatic nervous system functions, sleep disorders, migraine, blood vessel differences, um, fibromyalgia and other chronic pain conditions. Um, these are really common in autistic and ADHD folks. And this is not well known or well understood by the healthcare system. Um, I'm making this list, um, showing you this list um, specific to autism, um, but there's, you know, a you know, when we think, when I think about autism and ADHD, I think about these as, you know, a huge, huge overlap. And so many, many of what I'm sharing, um, I, I, I would be, um, I, I do it, even if the slide says autism, um, I'm going to say autism, ADHD for a lot of these co-occurring conditions. So, um, you know, in, in medical school and residency, I was taught that these things commonly occur with autism. Um, but I was, it was, it was never really wondered, like, why? Turns out when you zoom way out, it's that connective tissue and the nervous system and the immune system, all of this crosstalks through the whole body, which is why many autistic and ADHD folks have systemic health conditions. And when I shared with you the rates of premature cardiovascular disease, these things potentially are connected to that. What we know is that everything is connected to everything. And so, uh, unfortunately, and um, uh, one, 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 one of our patients uh, provided provided this analogy that I thought really really worked before I share the unfortunately. Um, and by the way, I'm, uh, I'm 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 done with my content warning about death and suicide. Um, if uh, if 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 a member of my team can type that in the chat, that would be amazing. Um, in case folks um, opted out from that part. Um, so the idea of a ball of yarn. If you pull the wrong string, you make the knot tighter. You have to find the right string to pull. And unfortunately, um, the healthcare system is all too often fragmented. All too often, um, body parts are thought about as separate entities when really everything is connected to everything. And unfortunately, sometimes some of the standard management of some parts of these neuroimmune conditions that are more common in neurodivergent people, sometimes the standard management of some parts make the other parts worse. For example, if someone has chronic pain and they are prescribed a muscle relaxant, but they also have a sleep disorder like obstructive sleep apnea, and they also have underlying hypermobility where they have stretchy connective tissue, well, potentially that muscle relaxant made their stretchy connective tissue stretchier and made their airway obstruction worse, which made their dysautonomia worse, which made their pain worse, and it's just on and on and on. So, when we launched All Brains Belong, um, you know, not only was it really clear to us that we needed to, to do anything for the neurodivergent community, we have to do everything, that it's not just medical care, we're also looking at employment and education and social connection, but even within the, you know, the, the, the medical care bucket, there is a lot of unlearning and reimagining that has had to go into this. And um, what we have learned the most from is our patients in you know building this community village of learning and healing together. Um, that is where um, I think the 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 the, the most um, the most uh, successful reimagining has come from that. What we're about to do before I launch into this conversation between me and uh, my colleagues here at All Brains Belong, um, Sierra Miller and Gabe Borzella, we recorded an interview last night about our experiences um, navigating this, doing the unlearning and reimagining. Um, but what I'm, what I'm gonna just put forth is that um, we're, we're intending this conversation to be addressing the double empathy problem. 
double empathy problem, if you've not heard that expression before, that's a term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who is an autistic social scientist in the UK, um, who uh, found through research that it is not that there is one set of normal social skills. It is that when there is a mismatch between neurotype, between autistic versus not autistic um, uh, neurotypes, that mismatch of worldview, mismatch of communication style, that is where communication breakdowns happen. So there, you know, the double empathy problem can be thought of in so many different ways. And I think as it relates to the healthcare system, um, we're trying to bridge the double empathy problem between, um, you know, what, what, what we know about neurodivergent health and what we know about being trained um, in and, and, and having practiced for a long time in the traditional healthcare system. Because I think that um, it's a mismatch, it's miscommunication between healthcare providers and patients so often um, because of the mismatch in communication styles and content. So with, with that, um, David, if you can cue up the video, we will start. So this video is 29 minutes long. Um, it was an hour and nine minutes originally, so we worked really hard to get that get that pared down. Um, and so um, during while the video is playing, we'll have the chat going and then we'll still have plenty of time for conversation to follow. All right, here we go. The theme of the month is neurodivergent health. You know, as 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 I, I think we I think I think we should share with our audience that you know not all our patients are neurodivergent, um, and certainly not all our patients I would identify as being a neurodivergent, um, uh, and they come because their needs were not met by the traditional healthcare system. That's what they have in common. That's what they all have in common. Um, and amongst that group, um, the overwhelming majority of our patients have this pattern, right, of neuroimmune conditions. Um, I think they most often talk about not feeling listened to or heard. Um, and I know that's kind of a vague thing, but um, I think being, feeling like they're having their symptoms dismissed, whether that's because, oh, you're young and no, you shouldn't, you can't be in that much pain, you can't have this thing or, um, oh, this disorder is so rare, you couldn't have it. Um, I was talking to another provider about, you know, yeah. neurodivergent healthcare and how common, how some medical conditions tend to coexist and that there's like actual literature and papers out there about it. And this is someone who's probably like five to 10 years my senior, like they've been in practice that much longer than me and they had no idea. They're right. like, I didn't know that, you know, these things happen together. Um, and so I think the issue is that these things are not on people's radar that because it's not being taught. Well. Right, so let's start there. So what do, what do you remember, um, if anything, about what you were taught about autism and ADHD? Nothing. I had no idea they could coexist. Yeah. I was never taught that they could co coexist, yeah. despite yeah. they almost, like, they, they, they coexist more often than they don't. Right. Yeah. I feel like for me, autism education was like developmental milestones and MCHAT and that type of stuff for kids. And then ADHD was, this happens in kids and we use stimulants to treat it. And then- Yeah, they were like, very, they were separate. I mean, I was not taught that autistic physiology was different than non-autistic people's physiology. Like I was taught, I mean, like, so, I mean, there was, there, there was like, so, you know, the deficit-based paradigm of like, you know, here are the things that, that are wrong 
um, and, and we call this autism, um, in kids, there was never a discussion about autistic adults. Um, I don't know, like, I don't think that I had any ideas about autistic adults, despite being one and not knowing. Um, but like, I, uh, like, like, it was just never on the radar that like, there were autistic adults, let alone the medical conditions that people have. So like, when the list of all the co occurring conditions, these are all things that kids had. Um, there was also like, you know, the, 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 the medical conditions that all the autistic kids had, they were, it was very strongly implied, if not explicitly taught to me that there was, it was like patient blaming, you know, like you have gastrointestinal things because you, you only eat chicken nuggets and pasta and you don't exercise. So that's why you're constipated. Like not that you have stretchy right. colons that get all, get, get all stretched out. Right. Par increased periodontal disease because of not doing oral hygiene. Right. 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 I mean, and this is, this is more systemic, right? In the, in the healthcare system, but the, the zoomed in uh, style of teaching, like, you know, there's psychology, psychiatry, and there's gastroenterology, and there are all these things that are separated. And but mm -hmm. in reality, we're, there are so many things that are interconnected that it's it's silly that we are not taught more of a like zoomed out picture. This is like a an entire being that is has multiple systems that actually work together and rely on each other and are influenced by like how your DNA is being transcribed. And um, it's, it's just, it's unfortunate that that zoomed out more of that zoomed out approach to teaching medicine isn't taught because it results in the, in the zoomed in, like looking at these two things that you already know coexist and not seeing the, the bigger connections with some of these other things and how um, you know, how that impacts people in the healthcare system, impacts patients in particular. Yes. And I think that what you said is really interesting because I, I think that I would describe my medical education as being very top down. An autistic patient is more likely to have X, Y, and Z list of conditions top down, you memorize the associations and they're tested on board exams, but that's not how the patient comes in. The patient comes in bottom up and in a healthcare system that is so fragmented, like you said, um, the opportunity, the pattern is not created in a zoomed out enough approach. The pattern is created with way too, and you know, even, even people with the type of brains that are really good at pattern matching, the, 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 the whole picture of the pattern was not taught because it's not known. And one of the reasons it's not is that these, these patients are thought to be rare, right? So, so if, if what's described is that 2% of adults are autistic, I mean, there's zero chance that that's true. It would need to be more than that. Um, but anyway, it's thought to be, it's thought to be rare. So why would we make, why, why, why would medical education be structured on this entity that is, that is rare? Because there, because what's missed is that the neuroimmune conditions that are more common in autistic and ADHD people are connected to the things that are known to be very common. So, you know, when we think about like in our practice, right, how we, we see a lot of mast cell dysfunction and guess what? That's connected to diabetes and hypertension and like all the things, right? So, so right. And IBS and mood, uh, anxiety, migraine. I mean, migraines, it's, like, it's connected to everything, but yet yeah, not zoomed out enough to really I think that's what primes primary care providers for doing this type of work is because theoretically they're the ones who are already doing that kind of like look at the full body and the full patient and they're the ones who are seeing 
all the different things that are going on and know the patient longitudinally, longitudinally enough um, to theoretically be able to kind of see the connection between everything. But what I would say is that um, even though we have a, a, a population of clinicians who are ideally poised to spot the pattern, we have a medical system, a healthcare system that is thwarting primary care clinicians to have full access to their cortex, right? Like, so we have this, like, this healthcare system that is forcing primary care clinicians to see, you know, a, a patient every 10 minutes, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And most practices are 15 minute visits for follow ups. 30 minute visits for new patients or, you know, uh, wellness exams or whatever. And on top of that, you're managing an, an electronic medical record system and paperwork and interpersonal work stuff. It's like you, you have, you have five, five or 10 jobs within one job already. And so not, not, I, I don't want to, there's no the blame is the system. I don't think that people go into medicine intentionally wanting to dismiss people at all, but it's just, it's something that ends up happening. You know, you're exhausted, you're tired, you, you didn't eat breakfast, you didn't have time to eat lunch. And then you're, and then you just, you lose, um, um, what's it called? You get dysregulated, but on there's, there's a line that, that happens and you're like, backed up against the wall and feel like you you know in some some ways it may be the provider kind of um advocating for their own access needs by saying okay we don't have time to talk about this today but not knowing that that that's how that makes someone feel you you don't have the cognitive resources to do what needs doing in that moment because the system is thwarting you and so you you're anyway you don't have the ability in that moment to zoom out, because that's an executive function, it's like a higher order brain skill, to zoom out, to self-monitor, to know like what you're saying, how you're saying, your tone, your body language, all of this stuff. And I right. think that there's a lot of, you know, really inadvertent um, communication breakdowns. That yeah, yeah, unintentional dismissiveness. Yeah. I think like what we, what I, what I hear a lot, like when we have new patients, you know, the overwhelming majority of our patients have this pattern, right, of neuroimmune conditions, um, that, that there is physiology that explains these multi-organ system symptoms. People show up and they have like this laundry list of diagnoses um, and like, why would it make sense that a human being would have like 40 things wrong with them? Um, you know, turns out, you know, their connective tissue is different. Um, it's, it's just a different way of being wired. And it just so happens that these physical health conditions, which, you know, are, are, are exacerbated by dysregulation. And when your access needs are thwarted by like, you know, all of the systems, um, this actually drives like a worsening of neuroimmune conditions. But people don't right. know that. Nobody yeah. knows that. Yeah. They just like feel broken and they're told that they are broken and then they're like shamed for seeking help. So like, anyway, shame for seeking help, shamed for seeking help in the way that you authentically communicate when you seek help. And shamed for not complying with recommendations that don't work for your brain right when 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 we hear their story we can trace this back for like decades right like decades yeah um and it's about having the the opportunity to share your story in the way that works for you so some people need to info dump their story with mouth words. Some people need to bring a list. <laughs> yes, right, they, right, they, right. They're the patient <laughs> with the list, right? The one that's like shamed and othered by the healthcare system. They, yeah. they wrote that list, and that list is incredibly important because because it has all the information in it. Like anyway, there's some people like uh, you know we 
or we have a patient who I'll never forget, a new patient visit, you know, brought a mind map that showed me like, you know, all the things that like, this makes it worse, this makes it better. And I'm like, I know that pattern, right? So like, if you get the, if you get the patient's information in like their, so say like in their native tongue, like in their, in yeah, the way that, yeah. in the way that they best communicate, you get a ton more information, but the system thwarts patients from communicating. The people come in, I think the other thing that I often see, especially with kids coming in with neurodivergent kids especially is just that they have not been able to um access care in other settings um just due to the like sensory overload of the specific setting um and so yeah whether it's like providers not um knowing their sensory needs beforehand before actually coming into the visit or like just before walking into the room um totally. whether it's um like the fluorescent lights whether it's thinking that they're going to need a vaccine the entire visit and being anxious and not interacting the entire visit until they know they don't need one at the end um and that's why i like having the like information before a visit of what somebody needs what their sensory needs are because starting off the visit that way makes such a huge difference and if we didn't have that i wouldn't know necessarily well um you left something out how do we have that information we asked right like like that's that's the thing right so if you ask people what makes them comfortable and you ask and you and like you try to do those things they usually have a better healthcare experience. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just the systems within the systems already have like there's right. their standard expectation. Like this is how you communicate. This is how you take information. Like, you know, people, people teach you how to, how to take notes. Like yes. when you're in, when you're in school, here's how, here's how you study something without ever knowing how your brain works. Like, and, and then you try to fit yourself and mold your brain and your way, your whole way of being into the box that who knows who designed it, but the box that has become like the, the standard expectation of how, how to communicate, how to interact, how to socialize, how to just exist, how to be within the workplace. Um, and and it's 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 suffocating yeah i mean i remember even like as a pre-med student like you know my volunteer gigs or like some of my jobs after college before medical school like it was just so clear that there was judgment going on and that that what you just said like you know that there's one right way to do the thing there's one like like it was just so clear that it was not okay to show up as as one's true self not not just as as a professional like as a patient like i remember being like a young 20 something and i remember being like you know oh i hope like i have to do something i have to do something to make sure they don't think i'm weird or that i'm like melodramatic or that you know anyway i have all the things i have all the things i've always had all the things um and I, I, as a patient, I've never, you know, I, I, I've never had care for my all the things because I never tell anyone my all the things because that's a surefire where to get judged. <laughs> yes. Not because it's funny. It's just, it's, it's, it's one of those, it's just act in this way, communicate in this way, or you will go unheard. Yes. Like you have to, you have to communicate a certain way or, or you you won't be heard and not everybody can make that adjustment and so those are the those are the people that are staying away from healthcare because it's overwhelming or confusing or uh, uncomfortable or unsafe to yeah i see yeah. i feel like i see that so commonly like if if i'm talking to somebody about like being in a pre-diabetic range and before i even say anything they start with but i eat well and I've been struggling with my weight in my entire life and like preface it with like I'm doing all the things please don't blame it on me being at fault or or blame it on my weight um and it's just so ingrained in patients to kind of preface a visit with these are all the things that I'm doing because otherwise it's so common for it to 
because that's how we learn. That's we learn that diabetes is lifestyle factor related, and that's the only thing versus inflammation and genetics and all the other things. And mast cells. To do to it. Right, right. And that like weight isn't always totally changeable. Well, it's also that like, I mean, I mean, this is, this is like such a bigger picture. Like, so not only is there a right way to be a person, but, but like the message that there's a right way to be healthy too. And like, so, you know, when you think about like all of the anti-fat bias and shaming that goes on in the healthcare system, I mean, it starts in childhood. I mean, it's just, it's, it's so bad. Yeah. I think shame, shame is unfortunately one of those, one of those things that is, I, I don't even know why either taught from the very beginning, mm-hmm. you know, as children. I wish that it were normalized to say when you don't know, instead, what is modeled or what was modeled for me as a trainee is that you fake it till you make it. And that when someone says a thing that doesn't match your worldview, you quackify them. Well, that's not a thing. Uh I remember hearing in medical school, um, and thankfully I had a nutritional biochemistry background. So they said that taking vitamins is just paying for really expensive pee. And I was like, they were like, well, why would they say that? Because they stopped taking the vitamins because they felt guilty and shame. And I was like, because they don't know biochemistry. They don't, they don't understand that nutritional needs of different humans are, are just as different as the brains that are operating. So instead of saying, I don't really understand how the human cell and mitochondria and all of these different vitamins and minerals interact. So I'm going to say that, um, taking vitamins is stupid. You can get enough from what you eat. And, um, and then, and then I'm going to teach that to people that are training under me, who are then going to say these things to patients. And we all just don't know what we're talking about. (laughs) Yep. I remember being taught that people quote outgrow ADHD, kids outgrow ADHD. And, you know, I believe that I was taught it despite being, a, you know, an undiagnosed ADHD or like, anyway, that kind of mythology is just so widely held. It's the same way, like, I remember as a trainee, you know, the, pa- the, the patient with the list. Um, and like, I thought that was awesome because I'm a visual processor and I wanted to read the list. And, um, uh, but, but anyway, that person gets shamed. But also like the patient that comes in and says, you know, I read about this on, you know, WebMD or some other website. And like, I read this article and I want you to like, you know, how does this fit into my, like, I, I don't know. I just always thought that was awesome because they like, they were engaged in their health. And anyway, it, it, it doesn't, it's, it's not that hard to be like, I don't know about this. Thanks for the article. I'll read it. We can talk about it again next time. It's not that hard, but that's not model. The opposite of that is, 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 is model. But like right. in the context of what we talked about before, where the system is like, you know, you must see the patient every 10 to 15 minutes. Like, so now I have something else to do. Right. So- it's, 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 <laughs> unfortunately, I think within the medical community, it's learned behavior and learned behavior from maybe, you know, someone else's teachings that the list is bad and those, those patients are compl- complicated and you know, the eye rolling and, and all that kind of stuff. It's all, it's, it's learned. We weren't, we weren't taught how to, how to really manage that, you know, as a, you know, um, well, just see them more often. Right. Wow. Okay. Right. Right. (laughs) It's that easy. It is that easy. And I think like coming back to the, like, not feeling comfortable saying you don't know things like there's this expectation that a healthcare provider is a knows everything about every single body system and that's that's not feasible for anybody i think i mean i right. certainly don't know everything about every body system like primary care is really hard and right yeah 
Power here is really hard. There's so much to know. There's so much to spot. You're on the front lines, and then you have the system thwarting you, your ability to do what you're trying to do for your patients. Um, you don't have full access to your cortex, and you're trying to survive. And like, it, it feels a lot like treading. You know, it's like it, treading water and like trying trying to survive and trying to do everything you can for your patients. Um, there's just it's so much. Yeah. And I think for those in traditional primary care practices, um, whether you're hospital owned or private, I mean, what's normalized is the dysfunction of the system. It's yeah. like, yep, this is just the way it is. So, you know, so that's what we have to do. So we're just going to keep yeah. doing it. And uh, just felt like there has to be a better way to do this, but like everyone's stuck it's a failure of imagination, right? So like what we do all day, I mean, the only reason we're really able to do it is because we don't have a bureaucracy. Like the patients need a thing and we kind of like try to figure out how to do that thing. Um, and like a system, systems get dysfunctional. I mean, like I think individual providers are most frequently operating in systems where they don't have autonomy or agency to do all things like when I do trainings for like in services for healthcare practices um, or even like at you know conferences like people are like oh yeah that's really great that you can do that thing in your in your special setting um, but like you know us 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 people in the trenches um, you know what 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 about us and it'd be good to, to to wrap up maybe talking about like what are some things, not just like, you know, what are the medical conditions we manage and how do we manage them? But like, what are some, like, what are some things we do that are free to do that, like, I don't know, are different than, 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 than in, in other settings? Because I think that one of the things that we do is I think we, we teach patients that they are the experts in their own bodies. Many of them don't know that this is like new information that they're getting that lens is really a requirement for for trusting your intuition for connecting all the dots for learning about your access needs and naming it when they're not met if you don't think that you're the expert in your own self because you got messages to the contrary your whole life it's huge yeah yeah, that's definitely, um, definitely makes a big difference. I think as a practice, us, you know, before patients even come in, we're asking them, before they even become our patient, they know that we care about how they learn information, how they would like visits to go. Giving people, uh, choices of sensory needs and ways to access care and a lot of those are free like turning off the fluorescent lights in an office um or letting people bring fidgets and whatever they want with them and making that explicit that like you can bring whatever you want with you having things in the office for people to be able to write their own notes so they don't have to bring their own things I think we uh, we often get feedback, right, that patients have never been asked for what they need. But the fact that we asked means that we care, and that makes right. that patient that much more comfortable to share things in their, like, authentic, unique way. Right. And the fact that, you know, like, like you said before, Gabe, about how, you know, we were trained to ask questions a certain way. Like, guess what? There are some brains who can't answer questions in the way that they're being asked in that default way. And so, like, just the idea of, you know, open-ended questions do not work for all brains. And the idea of providing people with a menu for examples of, like, these are, these are things we offer all people.
with all types of brains and you can let us know if any of these things would be helpful to you and it's not because you have you know an issue you don't have a sensory issue or a communication issue it's that you would just find these things helpful to have available to you that's all the other thing that i think that i've learned in this past year and a half is that like about just the idea of healthcare as community mm. and i yeah. think i think that has really really stayed with me because i think i think that's what i think that's what one of the one of the key things that we're doing i mean like it's not for everybody that's why we try to be really transparent about the model here and you know have people not not join not come when they're not looking for this model but remember at my my old practice in a traditional setting i remember meeting with people back to back who were had no friends totally socially isolated and it was like they actually like loved the same things and like the healthcare system says that you you know hipaa you know you can't do anyway but like turns out like they can introduce themselves to one another if you build a forum that they would both come to like think about how much we have learned from patients like coming as this as this as this village like when we think about like all these really complicated medical conditions that most of the healthcare system doesn't understand when you bring patients together and you give people an opportunity to describe in their own ways what their experience is like and what helps and does not help people feel alone they feel just alone in their lives. And once they know that they're not, there's so much healing in that. Hey. Ah. So I would love to know um, what, how, how, I mean, it's hard to say, like, how did that, like, and there were so many things that were part of that, but love to hear any responses or reactions or thoughts that anyone would like to share. Yeah, Steve, it's, um, that video is posted on our YouTube channel already. David, do you have the, the URL you just played that you could post in the chat? Because the whole Brain Club will eventually be posted, but that video is already posted. Yeah, sure. Let me find the original YouTube because. Oh, you put it in something else? I downloaded the actual file. Um, here it is. Okay, hold on a second here. The theme of the month is neurodivergent. Right. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. So, um, Steve is reminding me of the new fact I just learned that people can't copy from the chat, but if you click it, it will open. See if that will work for you. You could also, if 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 you go to YouTube and type "All Brains Belong VT," you'll find you'll find our station, and it should be the most recently posted video. If you so, write on the URL, also you can copy it. Even if you're not a host. Oh, maybe because I'm one of the um. I was able to you do are? I don't think you are a host. So that's yeah. cool that that worked. Yep. No technology. She says open link. I'm sorry. Cool. Open link. Yeah. Amy. Well, I just want to say thank you to the three of you because, you know, obviously um, as a, I am a medical patient of ABB and, 
you know, I'm always on the other side of just get, receiving the information um, from the three of you. And I just thought it was incredibly generous of, of all of you to kind of share the vulnerabilities of, you know, having this education, having this training, and then sort of moving outside of that model and the the risk, you know, even professionally that you're taking to, to be, to like care for all of us. Um, and that, that really it's like been such a huge result for me having, you know, you'll hear, everyone will hear next week, but that, you know, basically I haven't had healthcare until now. Um, and so I just felt like it was incredibly generous of the three of you to share your experience. And, um, yeah, I just, I really honor all three of you for what you, who you are, what you're doing. And I, you know, if the medical system is willing to like, even come in and see what you're offering, I think that they would be really blown away um, for the results that you're getting. So thanks so much. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. You know, I, I, I think um, I don't, I I I th I think that I don't I mean I don't, I wouldn't have had language to describe this when I was in my old life. It was not until like it's it's like the ability to zoom out and you know understand nervous system regulation like when you're when we say like the rest of the healthcare system it's like the difference between the healthcare system and the people in it. I think the people in it are, 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 are for the most part, like really well-intentioned and often really quite dysregulated by, by the healthcare system. And I think until, I mean, it's like, it's, it's like when you think about all, I mean, medicine's not the only profession where, you know, burnout, you know, the epidemic of, of burnout, like it's, it's, it's when the system thwarts you, thwarts your access needs from being met. And you don't even know that you, you don't even know what an access need is, let alone what yours are. Um, and that it's like what you do for a living that thwarts you, like that sucks. That sucks a lot. And so it, you know, I, I can only speak for myself in that, you know, as, as an autistic person belonging to autistic community um, and like, trying to do it differently within this community village model. Like I just, I really can't imagine any other way to practice medicine now that I've lived it. Um, because I, 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 I think it's like, when you think about the, you know, just even having transparent conversations about access needs, like it's, um, uh, I'm not gonna put, I'm not gonna put you on the spot. I mean, I'm not gonna put anybody on the spot, but like, you know, sometimes it kind of sucks to be a patient here. You know, we don't answer the phone. Um, uh, you know, and, you know, it, it's, it's because we don't have the kind of brains that can answer the phone and see patients at the same time. And we tell you that, and like, we're just kind of modeling, like, what would it be like to be in, 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 in a community in relationship with other people where you transparently showed up the best you can and made it okay for everyone to show up the best they can. And that's, there's a lot of unlearning that would have to happen for a lot of people because specifically how medical education teaches not that. I just want to say really quick that I know that that's something you have up front and I don't know what other, I don't want to say what other people's experiences are, but my experience is like, if I text, it's like somebody in the team, whether it's like Lizzie or Olivia, like, it's just like the way that you created this, like, I don't feel, I feel cared by, you know, for by everybody. And so if I am to text, I do feel like I get an answer, whether that's like a prescription med or an upcoming appointment. And it's like, it does feel like the team of people know me and, um, or are getting to know me more. And so it feels better because I don't actually want to make a call. I'd rather have to send a text. That's awesome. Sarah. You know, I, 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 one of the things you're making me think of is this, is kind of the cost of this emphasis on professionalism. And because 
because the uh, the emphasis on professionalism seems like what you're getting people to do is to identify first with a profession and and first with other professionals and 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 with the the profession that employs you and and the the co and that's in contrast and so now you can't show up as you you have to show up as this expert and 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 that's very different than healthcare as community and and so it pre it really prevents you from showing up as a person and and i think it also leads to a lot of lawsuits because now once you've held yourself out as this per this person that's got, like got this big uh, extra special expertise that's supposed to know everything and belong to this profession that knows everything now you're suable and and if you just show up as you like fallible vulnerable human being that's trying their best and doing their best then it's out on the table you know fallible vulnerable human being trying their best doing their best but going to make some mistakes along the way that's part of the package if you want healthcare here that's what you get Right. And I think that, you know, uh, how, how, what I connect from that is also what we know is that relationships are everything. And it's, it's, it's really about reflecting on what goes into a healthcare relationship. And like, maybe, maybe rethinking a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the things. Um, that 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 medical education truly explicitly teaches that often interferes with relationships. Sierra. Yeah, I think just on that point, Sarah, I think that it's there's it's so common in that like zone of professionalism to teach people to hide certain things about themselves. I mean, I I was definitely taught in school specifically to like not tell patients or other providers about my like sexual orientation. Um, and I think that's why a lot of healthcare providers who are neurodivergent aren't disclosing that to their employers, not disclosing that to their coworkers and definitely not disclosing that to patients because it's, it's viewed as such a liability. And that means we have less representation. That means we can't connect with people as much. It's yeah. Thank you, Sierra, for saying that. I mean, I even I remember I remember even as a like as a resident, like I don't know that anybody like explicitly told me to cover my tattoo, but it was like strong, it was like strongly implied that there were looks. Um, and um, like when you really think about how that's not even an aspect of identity that someone is hiding, um, of 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 who you authentically are as a person. Like if you are explicitly taught, um, hide your true self. I mean, at that game, and it. Oh, like in, in now that we're in like you know in 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 our new real lives, right? We, like like how often does some form of disclosure or just like some sort of sharing of something about one's authentic self is what cues safety for a lot of our patients. And that's, that's the opposite of what I was taught. And like, obviously it makes sense. So, um, with that, um, this is a, a great a great segue to next week's topic. Um, we will be hearing from a community panel of neurodivergent folks sharing their experiences interacting with the healthcare system. So part part two of this conversation next week. So thank you all. Thank you all so much for being here, and I hope you have a great week. <laughs>